This is a public service announcement reminding you to enjoy this season. Yeah, Christmas is approaching and life is not slowing down at all. There are shopping lists to complete and work gatherings to attend and far too many conversations that start with, yes, dear, I'm going to invite her. She is my sister, even though she dresses her ferrets up like wise men. There's no way to downplay the stresses that go with this season. But I think the most Christian thing that I can do this time of year is to celebrate. Christmas means the Messiah has come for all people. It means we now get to collaborate with God in the restoration of the world. It means hope and joy has come. Listen, there are at least 223 calories in one cup of eggnog, but get a refill because all of creation is waiting on you to join the celebration. Think about this. God loves you so much that he sent his son to earth. Let me say that again. Maybe you can hear this for the first time. God loves you so much that he sent his only son to earth for you, for me. And I get so stressed and worried that Amazon's not going to get a package here by Wednesday. You know, I think when I fret and worry about making Christmas perfect, God says to me, what are you going to do to make this even better? Christmas is God's way of saying, I'm not done yet. The party, oh, it's just getting started. Isn't that great? Ah, oh, thank you, Jesus. Wow. The music today has been so good, I thought I'd keep it going, all right? It's Joy Sunday. I'm going to sing for us. You're going to join me in the very first song I ever learned about joy, right? How many of you know this song? I've got the joy, 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 joy down. Where? Down in my heart. Down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 joy. Down. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in H-E-A-R-T. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. You know, I know this song in Spanish. I'm going to teach it to you. It's easy. Yo tango, yo tango, gozo, 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 in mi corazón. Yo tango, gozo, 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 in mi corazón. Then you say, donde? En mi corazón, donde en mi corazón, tengo gozo, 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 en mi corazón, por qué, por qué Cristo me salvó. How about that in Spanish? All right, wait a minute. You know the verse, and if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. You guys, did you learn that one in Pennsylvania? Okay, there's a version of that that I also know in Spanish. I'm telling you, you came the right Sunday. Oh, no, el diablo no puede quitarme el gozo que tengo en mi corazón. Que tengo en mi corazón, que tengo en mi corazón. Ouch! Oh, no, el diablo no puede quitarme el gozo que tengo en mi corazón. Porque Cristo me salvó. Woo! Thank you very much. Woo! <laughs> yes. Joy. Today we talk about lighting the third candle of the Advent wreath. So how many of you have wondered, why is it pink? <laughs> Anyone thought about that? You know, it's a pink candle. I'm way over here. Well, I got it right here, don't I? Pink candle. 
Why is it pink? It's an interesting story. You know, I, I, I described a couple of Sundays ago that this tradition of Advent probably began in about the 5th century, about 1,500 years ago. The church began celebrating this season of Adventus, Latin for coming. And uh, it actually began a little more somber. It, it kind of developed in the same way that the Lenten season developed around Easter. And, uh, and it kind of borrowed that same mood. And that mood is a little more somber. It's a little more... Um, uh, I don't know, inward. It involved fasting, the early Advent um, season, the four Sundays leading up to the, to the lighting of the Christ candle on Christmas. And it's all symbolized, every one of those Sundays, by the color purple, which is royalty. It's the coming of the king. But they determined that since Advent really, truly is, is much more joyful in its essence in a way than, than the cross and, and the time, the season leading up to, uh, to Good Friday and the cross, ultimately the resurrection, they decided to add one Sunday of the Advent season and make it about joy. And, uh, and so they, they decided to set it apart just a little bit, and they in fact called it, okay, so you've got the joy candle here, they decided to call this candle on this Sunday, Gaudette, Gaudette, it's a French word, and it literally means rejoice, Gaudette in Domino Semper, now some of y'all might know the word Semper in Latin, Semper Fi, always Faithful, always faithful. Semper, uh, Gaudet, rejoice and domino in the Lord. Semper, always. It's Philippians chapter 4, I believe verse 4. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. And that's what the name, the word Gaudet means. It literally just means rejoice. And they decided this particular Sunday to, to turn the priestly vestments pink and rose-colored, and really set this Sunday aside for a day of joy as we move toward the coming of Jesus. And that's what we think about today. We think about joy. I have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. And as I looked at the various passages in Scripture, the Bible talks a great deal, of course, about joy. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Joy is born in our lives as we abide in the vine, as we abide in Christ. Joy is, is uh, this deep sense in our hearts that God is in control. And I wanted to take us to a passage today that is actually a little out of the ordinary. I've, in all my research, I didn't see one Advent sermon on Psalm 126. Turn with me, actually, back to Psalm 120. Psalm 120, we're going to work our way to Psalm 126. But as we do that, I, I want you to understand how this Psalm, Psalm 126, really speaks to us today about joy. What is joy? How do we experience joy? Where does joy come from in our lives? And the reason I, I would like you to turn first to Psalm 120 is because Psalm 126 falls right in the middle of a mini songbook in the 150 Psalms that is called the Psalter or the songbook of the, of the early church, of the Old Testament uh, believer, believing church, if you will. And it's this 15 song um, little miniature songbook. I brought for you just as an illustration to kind of wrap your mind around this. Uh, this right here is our family Christmas songbook. And we have had these as a family for... I don't even know how many, 25 years probably. I think Karen put these together. They're just, you know, a little, little ringy thing and, and about 24 songs, 25, go tell it on the mountain, is the 25th, that we have, uh, we pull it out every Advent season and every night as a family, we light an Advent candle. 
and celebrate Advent. We've been doing this probably since, the, since Jay, our 27-year-old, was probably one year old. We've been doing Advent as a family. And at the end of our evening together of, of reading a story, doing Advent, I don't know if you remember the little barn doors way back in the day with kids and the Advent little... Uh, calendars that you had, but we'd always finish with a song, and so Karen put this together, and for 20-some years now, whoever's night it is uh, gets to pick a song out of the Christmas songbook. Well, I I pull this out because, show it to you, because this songbook is gathered from Christmas songs from all over the ages, Joy to the World, right, written how many hundreds of years ago, and others of them written just years, you know, within, within the last 20 or 30 years, some of these Christmas songs, more recent ones, and it's a collection of songs. Well, that is what Psalm 126 falls in, and this collection is called the Songs of Ascent, the songs of ascent. In fact, right there at the beginning of chapter 12, Psalm 120, right? A song of ascents. A song of ascents. And the way this worked is these 15 songs that were in this unique song book were to be sung by the children of Israel, by the Israelites, three times a year as they went up to Jerusalem. Ascents. As they took their steps, made their paths, their journeys up to Jerusalem for the three festivals, for Passover, for Pentecost, for tabernacles. Three times a year, the children of Israel were to go up to Jerusalem for a week-long celebration. And this was their songbook. And there's something very interesting as you really look into these songs is they literally fall into a rhythm. A a song of trouble. Look at Psalm 120. I call on the Lord in my distress. Save me, Lord, from lying lips. Woe to me that I dwell, verse 5, in Meshech and live among the tents of Kedar. It's a song of trouble or of trial. The second psalm in this cycle, Psalm 121, is a psalm of trust. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Verse 5, the Lord watches over you. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. So it begins with a song of trial or trouble. Second of all is a song of trust. I will trust in you. And then thirdly, it's a psalm of triumph. Look at Psalm 122. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. It's a song of triumph. And then we go back again, much like life. And these psalms of these songs of ascent are really, I believe, meant to kind of reflect the patterns or seasons of our lives. Because it goes back in Psalm 123 to the same cycle, a song of of trial or a song of trouble. Look at verse four, 3 of Psalm 123. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on us. We have endured no end of contempt. We have endured no end of ridicule. Psalm 124, trust. If the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive. Verse 8, our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. And triumph, 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people now and evermore. Do you see it? Do you see this pattern? Trouble. Trust and triumph. Trouble, trust, and triumph. It, it, it very much is like the seasons and rhythms of our lives, which brings us then to Psalm 126. And if you look at that pattern, what would Psalm 126 be? It's a psalm of trouble, right? That's where we're right back again into this trouble to this facing the issues of our lives trouble and let's look together well no before I have us look at verses one through three to begin with I want to describe the setting 
of Psalm 126. Remember I said that these psalms are taken from kind of all over the time frame and gathered together for this songbook. Well, this particular psalm, it, uh, it's a song of ascents, but it doesn't tell you who wrote it. About half the psalms are written by David, which is right at 1000 B.C., Many believe that this psalm was written by Ezra, Ezra the priest, and he would have written this much later in the, in the 400s, uh, probably around, well, Ezra returned with, the, uh, with, with some captives in around 458 uh, B.C. back to Jerusalem following the exile. This psalm was written late in the life of Israel in terms of, uh, you know, thinking of David and Abraham and all of that. This psalm was written, the setting is probably, as I said, Ezra, after the people were able to return to Israel. Uh, Actually, the return was in 538 B.C. is when Cyrus, uh, king of Persia, took over from the Babylonians and he allowed the Jews to return to Israel. And so in 538, under Zerubbabel, I know there's a lot of biblical history, but under Zerubbabel, a group of people returned to Jerusalem. And that's the setting for verses 1 through 3. Let's look at them together. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Okay, just pause on that. This was like a dream. I'm just going to attribute this to Ezra. I don't know who wrote it, but... If it was Ezra, Ezra saying it was like a dream when Cyrus said, you can go back to Jerusalem. They had been in captivity for about 70 years. And now they're being allowed to go back. This was amazing. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Our tongues with songs of what? Joy. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. That's what they were singing. Then it was said among the nations, in fact, the Lord has done great things for them. I mean, this is incredible. When does a nation taken away as prisoners of war 70 years later be allowed to go back to their homeland, released to return? The nations are like, wow, what a great God they have. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Okay, that's the setting for Psalm 126. Doesn't sound a whole lot like what? Psalm of trouble, does it? (laughs) Doesn't hardly seem like it would fit this pattern of trouble, trust, and triumph. And yet, you know what? Trouble is exactly what Psalm 126 is all about. Because verses 1 through 3 describe the elation that was in their hearts when they were given permission to go back. When they were allowed to return, when it was still in their minds, much like a dream. How glorious is the Lord for allowing us to do this. But then we sing the second stanza. Restore our fortunes, Lord. Like streams in the Negev, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out, what? Weeping, (laughs) carrying seed to sow. They will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Boy, the mood absolutely changes in the second stanza. Restore our fortunes, Lord. This is actually a companion psalm to Psalm 85, who many attribute to be written at the same time. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sins. You set aside your wrath. You turned from your fierce anger. Verse 4, restore us again, God, our Savior. 
Verse 6, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? You see, what happened was the exiles who were given permission in 538 to return to Jerusalem, do you know what it was like when they got back? When they actually got back in Jerusalem? Well, I, took, uh, I, I pulled this picture. How many of you know just a few months ago of the fire that occurred in Paradise, California, where the fire just roared into that city? In fact, I don't even know, 80, 90, 100 plus lost their lives. This, they say that never has, has a fire just kind of flowed into a city like it did that day in, in Paradise, California. And then the people were allowed to return to their homes after the fire died down. How did it look? It was devastation. This is how their town was, even as the people were in their cars trying to drive out of paradise. And you look at a picture like this and you ask, where is joy here? (laughs) Where is joy here? That's exactly what it was like when the Israelites returned to Jerusalem. We're told that when Nebuchadnezzar marched into Jerusalem in 605 and then ultimately destroying Jerusalem in 586 BC, not one stone was left upon another. It was utter, absolute, complete annihilation. And when the exiles were given the permission to go back, woo, joy! And yet when they actually returned, And then for the next 80 years, (laughs) you see, Ezra didn't return until 458 B.C., 80 years after Zerubbabel first returned with the first group. For 80 years, there has been nothing but struggle. And this is where we see Ezra writing these words. Restore our fortunes, Lord. And I want you to do two things, Father, like streams in the Negev. Please, Lord, restore our fortunes. Oh, God, please do something miraculous. Please do something immediate, like streams in the Negev, this simile. He's asking God to, the Negev was the southernmost part of Israel, is, and it is absolutely desert. Barren. Nothing is out there. No life. It it is now and it was then. And, and, And Ezra is saying, God, would you please pour like a rushing stream, like a babbling brook, like a mighty river, would you please pour your joy into our hearts? Would you do something miraculous and something immediate? How many of you ever pray that prayer? God, would you restore our joy, restore our fortunes? Would you please pour your mighty river into us? But then Ezra changes his tune a little more. And then he says this in verse 5. Verse 5, let me find it. Uh, For those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Oh God, please do something in my heart. This is where Ezra goes with this. Would you please do something in my heart? Would you please turn my tears into joy? You see, true joy usually isn't a flood. It's more like a farm. Many of you, I'm preaching to the choir on this. How many of you were raised on a farm, live on a farm, or have a pretty good understanding of farm life? Anyone in this room? I thought so. (laughs) You know, he's saying, Lord, would you please, like a flood, restore our joy? But then he shifts gears and he says, but you know what, Father? Joy, joy, it's more like a farm. 
And, and, and a farm is far different. It's planting and reaping. It's seasons. It's preparing the soil and watering it over and over and over again. And you know what he says is the water for this soil? Father, it's my tears. <laughs> It's my tears, Father. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. You know, we long for sudden deliverance. As I think about joy, right? We long for sudden deliverance and, and we rejoice when it comes, but God's normal way of working is much slower. And so the, the image of sudden streams in the desert now turns to the image of God's slow but certain work in our lives of sowing and reaping, of tears to joy. Hey church, listen to me. Joy is trusting when you want to doubt. Joy is trusting when you want to doubt, when everything in you is causing you to doubt. True joy is found in trusting in the Lord. Joy is receiving what you want to reject. You know what we want to reject? We want to reject trial. We want to reject hardship. We want to reject all of the things in our lives that cause us suffering. James himself, chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4 said, Consider it pure, what? When you experience, what? Trials of many kinds. For you know that it is in the trial that your faith is tested and that the tri trial and testing produces perseverance and perseverance then produces character and this character then results in something far deeper in our hearts, joy. Joy is celebrating when you want to fear. That's what Ezra is telling us here. That you want to understand true joy, it's found in the trouble, it's found in the trial, it's found in the fear, it's found when we plant these seeds of tears. I want to make four points. One, happiness and joy are not the same thing, church. You know, happiness is verses one through three. They were happy when they were allowed to return, <laughs> They were happy. I, th I thought about, as I thought about this, this sermon, I thought about a football game, right? And, and how when the camera pans the student section at a college football game, before the game begins, what does the camera see? Woohoo! Yeah! Woo! Wide out! Yeah! And then if the team gets down by 20, I'm not talking about Penn State at all, no. No reference to. The, the team gets down by 20, and then the cameras pan the same student section. What do they see? Ew. You see, happiness and joy. I, I thought about, you know, happiness being this dream that they had of returning, but what does Ezra say? Where does true joy come from? Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy. Happiness is circumstantial. Happiness is a good thing. I'm not slamming happiness. But it's not the same thing as joy. Joy comes from the Lord. It's deep in our hearts. Second of all, I want you to know this on this sermon on joy. <laughs> Tears matter to God. Psalm 56, 8. You, Lord, keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. I'll say that again. Psalm 56, 8. 
If you have shed tears this last week, then I want you to go back and and memorize Psalm 56 verse 8 because the Lord keeps track of every one of your tears. Tears matter to God. Thirdly, joy is grieving with hope. Hope is the is the seedbed of joy. It is knowing that God is in control. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 We grieve, but not like the rest of humankind who have no hope. This is a verse talking actually about losing loved ones. We grieve. Yes, we grieve. But not like those who have no hope. Joy is in grieving with hope. And fourthly, think about Jesus. (laughs) Think about Jesus. As we light this Godette candle, as we talk today about Jesus, the light of the world, think about Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Think about Jesus scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Church, on this joy Sunday of Advent, we gather our hearts before the throne of of God, knowing that we have a high priest who sits enthroned above all, He gathers up all of our tears. He pours in our hearts joy that is the fruit of the Spirit of God given freely to all who believe in Him. Church, like it says in Psalm 30, sing praises to the Lord, you His faithful people. Praise His holy name for His anger lasts only a moment but His favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping, may stay for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Our Father, we come before you today, and we do have the joy of the Lord in our hearts, deep down in our hearts. Lord, help us today to be reminded in the days and weeks to come, Lord God, that happiness and joy, they're not the same thing. We we give you thanks for the happy days. But Father, we thank you that the tears that we cry, the pain that we endure, the trials that we face, Lord God, those are the seeds that bring about a harvest deep, deep in our hearts of joy. Joy that is rooted in hope, knowing that you are with us. Jesus, we think of you today. We consider you. We fix our eyes on you, who for the joy set before you endured the cross. Lord, we think of you so that we do not grow weary and lose heart. And we pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Rejoicing in you always. Amen.